Welcome to the All About You podcast. My name is Sheila and I am your host. And in this conversation, we are going to go into the world of yoga with my guest, Sue Flam. Sue, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Sheila. I'm so happy to be here. Sue, we've got so much to cover because you are a yoga teacher and you are also an author. Please, can you introduce yourself? You're going to do a far better job than I would. Thank you so much. Yes, I would love to. You know, it's it's also kind of hard to put us into little categories because I'm actually so much more than just those things. But those are two things that are so dear to my heart. I am a yoga teacher. I uh, teach. I train teachers, and I teach a lot of things that are fall within the category of yoga. But also, I'm now also studying studying family constellations, which I also would love to talk to you about after the podcast. <laughs> um, but um, in terms of my history with yoga, I started practicing when I was like 12. I went to a meditation in those days. It was called TM, Transcendental Meditation, um, which now people um, has, become, has become very popular. But I was babysitting for some people and they said, you know, we're doing this meditation thing. I think you would like it. So I went and I had to bring my little piece of fruit. I got there and and when they were teaching me and they gave me a mantra and they were teaching me and I closed my eyes and they gave me the mantra, I started saying the mantra and I saw like mandalas and I was had this thought, oh, this, oh yeah, like, like it was something I had done before, like I remembered it, like it was like a memory. And so I started doing the meditation and then when I was a little bit older, my mom uh, there was like a yoga class happening at the church, the local church. So she said, you know, do you want to go to the class? I was like, yeah. And I just fell like head over heels in love with yoga. And I'm still completely passionate about it. I still study. I'm always a student. And yoga is such a big subject. It's not just postures. Postures are just one aspect of yoga, yoga asana. Um, yoga is so much more. And so with my years and years of practicing and teaching. I've been teaching for more than 45 years now, which will tell you a little bit about my age, <laughs> but practicing for so many years as well, much more than that. I was doing a kind of a teacher training or like trainings in restorative yoga, which is a kind of one of my specialties. And I had a lot of different notes and I decided I'm, I'm going to put this into a book. And it, and it just came. It, 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 I'm not going to say it was a channel book it's because it was a combination of me, but also like I had been saving quotes for many years. And then like I just thought, I'm going to put the chapters down. And I put the chapters down and then there was a quote for every chapter, like perfectly fit. And that's how this book was. It was like, it came out like a flow. It just flowed out of me. And I think I have quite a few books inside me. So The Restorative Yoga with Assists is one of my books, and I have it in English and Spanish because I teach in both languages, and I travel and, and teach that teacher training, but it's not just a teacher training. I have just normal people that aren't teachers as well that come into the training and take it as well. And I, I do a lot of work now in Ireland, partly because my daughter lives there, but also I just love going to Ireland. But I've taught before COVID in South Africa, in Belgium, in Holland, in many different places. Um, so, and of course here in Spain and my more recent book, 93 Prescriptions for Joy, you know, I want to cultivate joy and inner peace for others. But, you know, I, I always say, I teach what I need to learn and I'm still teaching it like the same things over and over because it takes a long time. I like to think about the practice in decades. You know, if you can't touch your toes, it's fine. It's, it's not a requirement. Yoga is an, an experience Yoga means union. It's about becoming one with yourself, becoming one with you. So what is between you and being at peace? Or what is between you and being in yoga, yogic state, being in calm, connected with your center? And so that can be many different things. It's not just about the practice of the poses, but how to work with the mind. So many things. There's so many spiritual practices, spiritual teachings within within the practice of yoga. When I think of yoga, and certainly a lot of people I've spoken to, they say, oh yes, that's that thing where you virtually are upside down, balance your whole body on your shoulders or in your contorted pose. Well, okay, we do see pictures of people doing that, but I'm pretty sure they didn't learn that in a couple of weeks. That's probably been decades to get to that point. 
yoga is very misunderstood and when I've spoken to people who do practice yoga somebody does yoga they're expecting a baby and it helps somebody else has got an injury it helps somebody else just just wants a bit of me time so off they go to weekly yoga class and it's just okay no husband no children no where's my have you got this what time time for them Mm -hmm. so I certainly appreciate the exercise part is one part of it but it's also that me time let's have a bit of quiet tranquility I certainly get that so let's talk about somebody who I you know I really want to get into yoga where do they start yeah yoga has become such a fad and such a a thing I mean everyone is doing yoga so many people are doing yoga right it's it's really been a movement people come to yoga for many many reasons and it's all fine you know some people just come to yoga because they love the physical exercise of it many people have come to my classes because they wanted to relax or they wanted to become more flexible or they wanted to de-stress or they wanted to get in better shape everyone has their reason and some people they come and they just enjoy the class but some people get more into it And there's so many varieties of yoga now, so many different quote-unquote styles, uh, including chair yoga. You can do yoga from a chair. There's just so many different ways to to come to yoga and so many different teachers. I just think that finding the right teacher for you is very important, someone that you really connect with, someone that you feel good with. I have my own preferences of what I like and what works for me, and I've tried so many different styles of yoga. I personally practice Iyengar yoga. I study with an Iyengar teacher, and I bring that into my practice, but I began at a place called Kripalu in Western Massachusetts, which is a very big learning and teaching center. But yoga, you know, as I was saying before, meditation is actually one aspect of yoga, which people don't always realize, that the postures is one aspect, meditation is one aspect, there's the yamas and the niyamas, which are different kinds of teachings like nonviolence, like contentment, like non-stealing, like not not stealing, like not that you're going to steal something, but stealing someone's idea or or comparing some yourself to someone, oh, they're better or not. These are all different like teachings that fall within yoga. So there's many ways to practice and there's so much out there right now. So, you know, like I'm happy to recommend, but I don't know. It's, it's such a big world out there. So, you know, finding the, the teacher that you resonate and the style that you like, because there are so many different ones. And it's not a prerequisite to be flexible. And people have this idea that, oh, I have to be flexible. I have to be able to stand on my head. I have to, not at all. You just have to be able to breathe. You just have to breathe. Even that's also an aspect of yoga, pranayama. That's just breathing is part of the yoga practice. There's eight limbs actually of yoga. And postures is one, breathing is one, meditation is one. There's five others. So it's, it's a big world. But I work a lot also with the mind because in restorative yoga and the resting yoga because, and I actually actually call restorative yoga the way, I I mean, you can call all yogas restorative. I would say all yoga is restorative, but there's kind of like this new style of resting that's come, come out more where you use props and bolsters and things to relax on. And what happens is when you go into these poses and are just relaxing and supposedly doing nothing, what happens is the mind comes in. And that's the practice of how do I work with my mind? Yeah, it's very interesting. The mind is not in the moment. It's either in the past or in the future. And that's where we want it. We're only living, we're actually in the moment. So a very interesting thing to look at. How do I work with my mind? How do I calm my mind? How do I understand my mind? And how do I do all this? And how do I realize that I am not my mind? Because we actually identify so much with the mind. That was like an aha moment when I lived in a yoga ashram back in my 20s, when I realized that I am not my mind and that I can either identify with it or not. You can observe your mind. You can actually observe, you can become quiet, you can close your eyes, you can go inside and just watch your thoughts and you'll realize, wow, I can watch my thoughts. So if I can observe my thoughts, then I must not be my thoughts. I must not be the mind. One way of speaking about it is one of the ways I talk about it, the witness consciousness. It's the consciousness that's witnessing, it's watching. It's noticing that my mind is thinking. It's also noticing the five senses. And I like to kind of make that like a benevolent witness. 
or a compassionate witness, because when you find that witness place, it can change your world. And so we're many, many times used to identifying with our story, identifying with the past or the future, and that keeps us from the moment. So it's a lot. That's why yoga brings peace, because it brings you into the moment. And when you actually realize, like, I have a house, I'm okay, I don't have to be worrying. And when you can disassociate from the inner critic, which is another big thing, it can really change your life. So we have got so much to unpick from what you have said that. <laughs> the first thing I want to say is initially you talked about yoga is about breathing, it's using the body and meditation, for example. And I remember when I first started doing meditation, the hardest thing is to try and calm the mind because as you quite rightly say, we're either talking or thinking about the past and what we're going to do next. The advice I was given, imagine it's a bit like training a puppy. You're just having to sort of gently bring the puppy back. And I sort of like, I got the training the puppy bit. You've got to do it gently and be kind to yourself, as in training your own mind. You're going to have thoughts. You're trying to meditate and you're thinking, oh, after this, I need to go to the supermarket. I need to get things for dinner. And after doing that, I've got to find this. And one of the pieces of advice was, Imagine those thoughts in a cloud, a bit like a cloud bubble. You've, you can see the writing, I need to go to the supermarket, but you just see that cloud, okay, I see you, and it passes by. And those clouds get slower and slower and slower. Mm -hmm. Using sort of the, the puppy and the cloud was a method of me to be able to calm that inner voice and the mind and, and to, to be able to do a meditation practice. But I think it's very true what you say is like your inner critic. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. we talk about that? Because we are all racing through life at an incredible pace. And we're not often very kind to ourselves, are mm -hmm. we? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can we talk about that in respect of a yoga practice? I mean, this is like a yoga practice. This is life. This is life practice. No, like, yeah, you know, there's something called boundaries, you know, putting a limit to take care of yourself. We sometimes have to put a boundary on the inner critic and say, we need to have a sit down. This is not really actually working you telling me that I'm not enough, or why did you do it that way, or all these critical thoughts. And we can actually say like, I'm gonna, like we're not allowing that, like we're gonna do it different now. Like I'm gonna take care of you, what is it that you're needing? Because these, these kind of self-critical things is, there's, a, there's something underneath it usually. There's a fear, there's a, a judgment, there's something going on underneath. So. Part of it is like seeing and understanding like what that's about, but also reassuring that critic that, okay, I'm not gonna stand for you to talk to me like that. Just like you wouldn't let somebody on the outside talk to you like that. We, we're so hard on ourselves. So the practice of yoga is really also about self-awareness. So when you're practicing, you're becoming aware. I always say the mat is like a metaphor for your life. So whatever comes up for you on the mat is what comes up in your life. So if you're judging yourself because you're not flexible enough, that's what you do in your life. So that is the practice, is being on the mat and working with that. So the practice of when we work, working with your inner critic, you're practicing. I'm gonna just try this. It's like, let's do an experiment. You know, I'm not gonna allow that thought. As soon as you catch yourself, oh no, I'm gonna think of something else. And one really good thing to think of is gratitude. What am I gra grateful for in this moment? Like divert the mind get it going in a positive direction instead of dwelling on what's not working or getting letting the crit inner critic you know really get to you thing about yoga people do yoga for a thousand and one different reasons if you go to some dance classes or exercise classes there's a lot of judgment still about body image body confidence We've all been to classes, and I've been to a couple recently, people there of different age, we've got the false eyelashes, we've got the full face of makeup, we've got the latest brand of XYZ fitness wear, 
And then you've got a lady who comes once a week. She's got on probably her husband's T-shirt, a pair of shorts or whatever, a big borrow and steal to get herself clothes for the class. And you sometimes get these two extremes. But I think with yoga, because you've got, as you said, you started incredibly young. Mm -hmm. People are doing it to the end of their days. Mm -hmm. People expecting a baby, people who want to have a baby, people who've had a baby, all shapes and sizes. Whenever I speak to people about yoga, one of the things that comes up is there is no judgment about what you look like, what you're wearing. People are just there for their own reasons Mm -hmm. and very accepting. I just get the feeling people will take their makeup off and go along as they are. Mm. Is is that right or is that just a perception of yoga? <laughs> well, one of my dearest friends touched my heart so much and some of you might know her. Her name is Tao Porshan Lynch. She lived to be 102. She became quite famous at the end of her life. She was also an actress. I'm sure she wore a wig and she wore makeup. She was an incredible yogini, an incredible yoga practitioner. You know, it doesn't really matter. These are like, we're in this body. We're all in a body. And whether you prefer to put the makeup or not, it's more like what's inside, you know, that's important, how you're feeling about yourself. Because if you're just putting makeup, because I just like to, you know, people have all these different reasons. If you're hiding behind it or you're judging yourself or the way you look, is that causing you pain inside? Because that's, I think, more the thing, like, are, how are you doing, each person, to look at? How Do I have to have the latest, you know, yoga clothes? I mean, as a yoga teacher, I mean, unless you're, I don't know, many yoga teachers can't afford those clothes, that clothing. It's just become, you know, this is a whole thing of our society, you know, of having to present some particular way. And we all have our different values. But when you go home at night and you lay in your bed, like, are you kind to yourself? Are you at peace with yourself? Is it okay? It's really very personal. Like, how are you with you? Yeah, I mean, I'm just really now looking so much at what is in between you and your inner peace? What is in between you and your self-love? For me, that's what's important. For me, it's just making space for everyone where they are in this time, in this moment, in this class. You know, I'm going to go teach a class tonight. I'll see who comes, you know. And just I just teach to, to who's there and make space for everyone because that's what I want to do for myself. I want to make space for me where I am, whatever wherever I am and whatever I might be going through. So Sue, let's talk about somebody. So someone's coming along to your yoga class for the very first time. What's going to happen? It depends on the class. Okay. But for one, I'm going to re- greet you. I'm going to greet you and I'm going to say, hi, what's your name or how are you? And I'm so happy to see you. And I'm going to welcome everyone and make a space because I'm, I'm very much about making a space and holding the space for whoever's going to be coming to my class. And then from there, depending on what, what kind of class I'm giving, and always it's, you know, if you have a problem, let me know or you don't. There's, there's always the option to make it your own in some way. So if you've got a problem with a shoulder or a knee or something, let the teacher know. Do you go straight into exercises or do you it give depends. A talk it or? depends on the class. I mean, usually I start with a meditation. Okay. Uh-huh. And chanting Om. Because just chanting Om, I'm very much an Om girl. <laughs> I love Om because it, it just brings you back into your center. That's why we chant it. When you chant Om, and if you if you just chant it, then you come into a quiet a quieter space usually within you. So, so I I always begin with the meditation, and so then om, almost always. My understanding is you're focusing on that to stop all the chattering going on in the mind. Yes, I also will have I will guide people to connect with their breath because the breath is in the moment. The breath is in the moment. The body is in the moment. The five senses are in the moment. Everything else is pretty much, the mind is, like we were talking about before, is either in the past or the future. And if you are like in the past, like we'll talk a little bit about depression and anxiety. So when you're in the past, when you're constantly thinking about the past, usually when someone's depressed, that's where they are, they're in the past. And when someone's anxious, they're thinking about the future. 
they're worrying about the future or what am I going to do with this situation or that situation. So part of the yoga practice is just coming back into the moment. And when we're in the moment, when we're connecting with the breath or the five senses, then the mind calms down, the mind quiets usually. And so that's part of, you know, one of my intentions is to be quieting, help to quiet the mind in the practice. And then depending on what kind of practice I'm teaching, if it's an active practice, or if it's a resting practice, or I teach a meditation class, you know, we're going to do different kinds of meditation or different kinds of practices there. So it really depends a lot on what class I'm giving. Let's take the example, maybe somebody is in their 40s and they want to have a stronger body. Mm -hmm. So if they want to improve their posture, their muscle tone, generally feel a little bit stronger in themselves, what type of yoga would that be? Well, that would be a more active class. And you mean like what style of yoga? Yeah. I do like the Iyengar system of yoga. It is an actual system, and I like that because it is a system. And at the same time, every teacher, it's like finding the right teacher because some Iyengar teachers I might not like. You know, more active a Hatha yoga class or a Vinyasa class, depending on what, what people resonate with. Because Vinyasa is like a flow from one pose to the next, also working with the breath, also longer holding times, a more definitely a more active physical practice. So that could be many different styles, but some styles, you know, focus more on like Kundalini, for example, it's not as focused on actual asana, though they, there is asana in there, but they're more focused on the breathing and raising the energy and meditation. And they also do asana, but it's, it's like a different kind of focus where Iyengar is very asana focused. I, there's also um, restorative classes in Iyengar and there's pranayama classes. And there's different kinds of focuses for any kind of yoga. Um, but there's Ashtanga yoga, which I also study. That's a very much more challenging. The Mysore Ashtanga series, there's several series, um, which I studied for a number of years. I love that, but I don't teach it. I don't practice anymore because, yeah, like as I'm getting older, it's like my practice changes. And actually, traditionally, yoga was taught one on one because everyone should have a personalized practice. I mean, should. You know, it would be beautiful. You know, that's the idea that everybody's different. Every day is different. Everyone's a world, no? So I might practice triangle trikonasana every single day, and every day it's different. I never get tired of, like, and they're like, oh, that pose again. No, it's like, oh, okay, where am I going to find myself in that pose today? How am I? Like, how's this? And how can I move into it in a different way? And always discovering another part of me or opening something else or oh, wow, if I, if I adjust this, I can actually breathe better. Wow, that's so cool. I'm kind of like, I don't know. I just find it so interesting. For me personally, I just find that, like the poses for me, other people might find it boring, but for me, it's just like, it's a world and I love to go into it. I love to go into the poses and get into like the details. It's very interesting what you say about if you go to a class and you're doing a particular type of yoga, but that could feel different for you every single time. Well, if it's the same pose, different day. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, because every day we're different. So in that sense, it's like you wake up and sometimes I feel very tired, but I go to my class and it energizes me. Or sometimes I might feel energizing and then I come out and I feel more centered or more grounded. But we're always in a different place. So it's always respecting where we are. But usually what happens in a class is you get the group energy and you get moving, and if you have a good teacher, you're gonna have a good experience, whatever the different style is. You know, someone who knows the, the poses, someone that's comfortable with them, with them, that can help, you know, with any adjustments that you might need. In the yoga class you're going to take tonight, you've got people who have been with you for quite some time? Actually, the class I'm teaching tonight is a restorative class. I'm gonna be doing a, a resting class. None of these people have ever been, so it will be, it's actually going to be two hours, it's a long, going to be a long class, uh, resting poses, and well, because um, it's also the full moon, and we're like in, the, it's also solstice, the full moon, Venus is rising up, there's a lot of this energy, I'm going to talk about that as well in the class, and I'm going to talk about tuning into your intuition, and I'm going, I'm actually going to bring some paper and some pens, and I'm going to have them ask a question for themselves at the end of the class. I'm going to have them, after resting and connecting, tune into themselves and 
answer a question that they might have using their own intuition. So I actually weave a lot of things, different kinds of things in my class depending on where I am and where I'm teaching and what's the subject. Like I just taught a class, what's between you and peace, your inner peace. And we had um, actually taught with a couple of friends and we had uh, an active yoga class, we had a resting yoga class, I mean, it, within the, the morning. We're actually making it into a full day retreat now because it was so amazing. And then, and then I brought in some family, dy- uh, family constellation dynamics. So I like to do all kinds of different things. I, I'm very creative, so I like to switch it up. Even when I'm, I'm teaching restorative yoga, but there's like a hundred ways to teach restorative yoga, you know, like, and I so many different ways to be with the poses. I also work with restorative yoga with hands-on assists. So like while you're resting in the pose with support underneath you, I'm massaging your shoulders or your hands or your head if people want to be touched. Always very respectful about that because some people don't want to be touched, but majority of people do. Just going back to this question, what's between you and peace? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, let's unpick that. One really interesting question that, that I like to ask is, What are you tolerating in your life? I was going to take a drink of water then and you stopped me dead in my tracks. I mean, what are you tolerating? That's like a really good question because when you see what it is you're tolerating, you realize, yeah, mm mm-hmm. So like right now what I'm tolerating is I am just like, my house feels very cluttered to me. I don't know about cluttered, not really cluttered, but I just have too many things. And for me, that is causing distress inside me but for you know for everyone like so, you know people talk about you know a relationship that's difficult so many different kinds of things that can be that they're tolerating it can be a financial thing relational thing partnership thing career thing you know i don't like my job but i just stay there it's looking at like what is keeping you there what is keeping you in that place yeah there's a lot of different ways to to look at that i think an interesting thing about those two questions as in what's between you and peace and what are you tolerating? They are incredibly powerful questions. A lot of people would be like, oh, uh, hang on a minute. Um, Yeah, some people may be able to relay their answer straight away. Other people need to go and think which of my problems I'm going to talk about or whatever. But often when we, as you say, tolerating something, that often shows up in a part of our body it may digestive problems. Mm-hmm. It, the mind and the body are so connected. You have a problem that you're over and over in your head. Should I go right? Should I go left? But that manifests in your stomach, your digestive system, or sleeping, or all of a sudden you get you know, stress in your jaw. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, the body, the mind, and the emotions, and the spirit, that's basically the, where we live as human beings. That's why yoga, the asana, the postures is releasing, very releasing for that, in that you're stretching, you're moving, so you keep things going, you can actually release some of that tension through that practice. We're thinking of of a problem in our mind, but then... We feel it in our body. You then get digestive problems or you get Exactly, and that's something, you know, I say like, your issues are in your tissues. So like if you've got something going on in your body, there's something that's speaking to you. So, and that's actually like what we explore in these workshops. We go into the body, we, we explore what are, what am I tolerating? We look at these kinds of things, you know, like what's going on, what's between me and my peace. So we go in there many different ways through yoga, active practice, through resting practice, through exercises and dynamics. Fascinating. So what I want to do now is I've got your book, 93 Prescriptions for Joy. Now, I, it's only a small book, but it is a weighty book in respect of its contents. I've picked out number 27 here in your book. Notice your internal dialogue. Make changes to support a healthy inner conversation and speak kindly to yourself. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Number 27. Does that hit home for you? Internal dialogue, 100%. Mm. I would never speak to anybody the way I speak to myself. Oh my God, you're so stupid. Why have you done that? Oh my God, can you not do anything right? We, we, we all do it. 
Exactly. We all do. That's we what we were talking let, about, the inner critic. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And that is so powerful. Mm-hmm. Seeing it in here, in this book, in black and white, so, oh my God. And I think when I was reading this book, and I went through all of them in one session, mm-hmm. that one really stood out, and I've sort of put a little bookmark there. And the other one that jumped out, number 91, using this prompt... Today I am grateful for blank because blank. Let's talk about gratitude because it's huge gratitude. I think gratitude can move mountains. I am so with you. That's one of my favorite subjects is gratitude. Um, but one, one comment about the book, sometimes I, I will read the whole book. I read it like, oh, I wrote that? That's so cool. <laughs> but um, I, if I'm not feeling well, if I'm, if I'm depressed or not feeling a bit down, I'll just pick up that book and read the whole thing. And I'm like, oh, wow, yeah. And the, I just get inspired by the different, the different ideas in there. But gratitude is, and I teach, this is like one of the main things I teach in my teacher training, actually, is gratitude. I have everyone keep a gratitude journal, and I have them write 10 things in the morning and 10 things in the evening that they're grateful for. And it could be just as simple as, you know, my shoes, my dress, like gratitude just coming out, like just really, really fast. Simple things. Just look around the room. What are you, what are you grateful for? You know, yeah, it's just... Exactly. And what the thing that's so powerful about gra- gratitude is that it can shift your energy because you, you can be in a kind of a down mood and when you start thinking about what you're grateful for, you will, you will feel better. But gratitude is an attitude of gratitude. It'll change your life because when you're thinking about what you're grateful for, it's like you become in, you get into a positive state, and you know everything is in this world world that we live in is vibrational. And what we vibrate with, like you know, you you get drawn to someone because you vibrate with them. You're like, oh, I like their energy, right? So when you're in a more of a grateful state, you're going to bring more positivity into your world. So I, you know, I always use this example, like if you have two guitars in two opposite sides of the room and you, and you pluck the E string, the E string on the other guitar is going to vibrate without ever touching it. And this is what we're like, actually. Yeah, we're vibrational. Everything vibrates. And we attract the same thing. So if you're like in a really bad mood, then it's like you can attract really difficult things, you know, grumpy people. And so it's like having that practice to what we call raise the vibration it's not like there's bad vibrations or there are we talk about lower and higher vibrations yes it is but we can take out the judgment sometimes we don't feel well you know sometimes we feel great but we can support that feeling on a higher vibrating on a higher level through gratitude it's one of like such a powerful practice i mean it's interesting when you were talking about gratitude there because what came to mind is I'm in the kitchen and I'm struggling with a drawer that keeps getting stuck. And then I go, Sheila, some people would be very happy to have a drawer. They would be very happy to have a kitchen. They'd be very (laughs) happy to have running water, a fridge, electricity. And you're complaining about a wonky drawer. I really have turned that round as in, okay, it's a wonky drawer. You are so blessed. A lot of people would love to have the problem of a wonky drawer. They haven't even got a kitchen and clean, healthy running water. Yes. Ten things in the morning and ten things at night. I think at night, it's rather nice to go through the day and go, oh, that was a really good podcast I did with Sue today. I really enjoyed it. We had a great discussion. Oh, I had a really nice lunch today. The avocado was just absolutely ripe to perfection. And just go through your day. Oh, the bus came on time. I made my appointment. This happened. And you think, oh my God, everything. I've just had a really good day. Because you are focusing on how your day went. And you're, oh my God, yeah, I got to my appointment on time. We had a good podcast conversation. Yes. Gratitude is, it's free. And it is so powerful. Whether you are writing a gratitude journal or just your thoughts at the beginning at the end of the day absolutely and where your attention goes your energy flows so let your attention go into gratitude let go go to the positive we have covered so much yeah we really did yeah we went all over we have but i really want to just say this little book 93 prescriptions of joy it's a small book 
go in your bag quite happily but I think it's one of those things you can pick it up open a page I'm not even going to look where I've opened I think that book will give you what you need at that moment you go oh really yeah oh that's a bit close to home so to speak or oh that's going to give me food for thought mm. that's what I like about this mm. Originally, I was going to make them cards, you know, like a oracle deck kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, it was just easier to do it as a book. Um, but maybe eventually I'll put make them into a deck. You've written several books. You are teaching courses. You are in your family constellation training. You are running classes. What's next? I'm working with someone to take a group to India, actually. In November of this year, yeah, I have um, some a retreat in Ireland in September, and another to teacher training that's also open as a retreat if people want to come. Also in Ireland, another place in Ireland. I just don't seem to be slowing down, and I have to kind of like, I have to. I'm going to cancel something tomorrow because I need to make a little more space for myself. Actually, I'm going to cancel something and take a class for myself, a gong session. So. I love that you are a yoga instructor and you are going to take a class yourself. Absolutely. No, I take I study with my teacher three times a week, two to three times a week. I take class. I'm not that disciplined, actually. I need to have that outside structure. I mean, it, I do practice on my own. It's not that I don't ever. I do. But I can't, like, I'm not going to practice an hour and a half on my own as I would go into a class. And it just helps me so much to have that structure. So I have to accept that about myself. Like, I need to have that structure. And plus, I just love, I love going to class and seeing my friends and practicing with friends and being there. So it really helps. Sue, thank you for a brilliant, brilliant conversation. So we're going to put all the links to your books, your classes, your retreat, and anything else that you are currently working on. I think you're a bit like me. I'm speeding up as I'm getting older. I'm certainly not <laughs> slowing down. And I'm hoping that's going to keep us fit and healthy in body and mind. Absolutely. And actually, I just created a three-part series, a free three-part series. If you subscribe to my newsletter, you can get that three-part on restorative yoga, resting yoga. Brilliant. Well, we'll put a link to that into the podcast as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sheila. Sue, absolutely my pleasure. And thanks for being a guest on All About You podcast. Hope you enjoyed that conversation. So if you would like to be a guest on the All About You podcast, please send me an email to allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com and let's get your story told.